Let's start with prayer then. Gracious Lord, we pray this day for your blessings upon our study of your word, of your truth, and particularly of your gifts that you give to us as we worship this day. Strengthen us in our faith and build us up that we might live out our tr your truth before the world and others might see you in us and be saved. For Jesus' sake, amen. All right, I want to finish our discussion from last week. We were mostly through with it before we moved to something else. So for now, uh, the discussion is still the ordinance of the common chest. It's page three, I think, is about where we got. So to recap, for any of you who weren't here, a, a city of... Uh, Leisnich in Germany asked Luther to help them uh, with financial issues. Of course, as a theologian, he's not a financier, uh, but nonetheless, uh, he, he offered his advice. Uh, the first part of our discussion was um, Luther's recognition of certain financial burdens on the church that were uh, causing the church to not have the funds necessary to do what God had commanded it to do, which is take care of the poor and the needy, uh, particularly the, the monasteries, uh, nunneries, the extra church properties. Uh, these things were, were financial black holes for the church. So Luther's advice was ultimately that these things be taken over by civil government and that the, the monasteries themselves be closed. Uh, so now we get to th the third and fourth parts of his discussion. Um, yeah, actually on page three, bottom of page three. Uh, this, and this is, you know, just a continuation. So actually, I don't even think I'm going to read that. I'm just going to read the next page. But uh, part, parts third and fourth on the bottom of page three are, again, further discussions about how civil government really should take over control of some of the lands that the church had so that they're not a financial burden on the church and that the church now has money to help the poor and the needy. So page, to, uh, page four. Yeah, something else some of that raised, someone raised a question of was charging interest and how the church thought of that. That's actually addressed under that part four. Uh, there was a thing back then called repurchase, which Luther speaks against uh, as another way of taking money from people instead of trying to help people, that the church should not engage in this business of repurchase. Repurchase was um, if you sold, somebody, somebody was poor and needed money, so they sold a property to somebody else. And they got, say, you know, $10,000 for it. Well, they would be allowed to repurchase it at a later date if they wanted for like $11,000. You know, so repurchase is selling something back to somebody who needed a loan, uh, but selling it at a higher price so that the guy takes a hit uh, and the guy who bought it in the first place makes a profit. And he speaks very strongly against that because it's a sort of loan sharking. So now, page four, fraternal agreement on the common chest of the entire assembly at Leisnich. So this is the whole city and congregation. This is the agreement they drew up, and they are actually agreeing to this. Uh, and, and, I, and it's an interesting thing because it shows us, I think, something for us in our day and how we should order the church. So it is ordered that in our church there shall at all times be kept two barrels or casks not to be removed in which bread, cheese, eggs, meat, and other foodstuffs and provisions may be placed, and a little box or two for coins, both for the maintenance of the common chest. Likewise, whenever our parish assembles in the church, two of our officials shall always be present to solicit each person for support of the poor, and the alms and love gifts thus received shall at once be contributed to and placed in these receptacles. Articles of food being perishable shall be distributed by the appointees among the poor as needed without delay in accordance with their instructions hereinafter specified. 
whatever is not perishable is to be kept until the following Sunday and then distributed as may be appropriate and beneficial for the poor. Other voluntary gifts made during days of good health and by the will at the time of death, insofar as they are made with a Christian intention, to honor God and love of neighbor, whether they consist of property, ready cash, jewel stores, uh, or chattels personal, shall be given wholly to this common chest and there remain. Faithful admonition there too shall also be made by our pastor from the pulpit and elsewhere in legitimate instances, even at the sickbed, if prospective heirs give their approval and the patient is still in possession of his faculties. So they give the pastor or the priest permission to talk to people about leaving behind their goods for the poor. And they had, uh, you know, the early church, we went through some of the practices, uh, the early church, how they elected deacons to, to wait on tables uh, to distribute the needs of the poor. That practice of deacons continued into the medieval church. And they appointed people in, in the church to act as deacons to the point of where they were stand by the box in the back and solicit funds from the people who came to church for the poor. Uh, money went in one, perishables and non-perishables in two other ones, and then they distributed it to whoever had need. And it's a committee that met regularly. This was a diligent work, not kind of an afterthought. Um, so a food pantry was part of this, as well as a distribution of funds. The point being, this is a very effective way uh, to communicate the gospel, the love of Jesus. It doesn't just you know, wish you well and send you on your way. It actually cares about your real life, your physical needs. So it's up to the church to genuinely care about people's physical needs in real life, collectively. It's not the pastor's responsibility, it's the church's. Yeah. It could be included in it. Uh, it, is, it is support of the church, in a way, and the church's work that it's given. So it doesn't necessarily have to be over and above a normal tithe given to the church. But you know, even things, material possessions, it's not just money. And with that, of course, labor and ability to work if the poor need it. So even, even it says, uh, you know, at the sick bed of prospective heirs, I don't know that I would do that. You know, if you're on your deathbed, it's, hey, before you go, how, how about considering a little gift? I don't, I don't think I'd do that. You know what? probably have told you this, what Bob Hope's last words were. Have you ever heard this? I think it's true. His wife asked him where he'd like to be buried, and his last words were, surprise me. <laughs> anyway, a little off the track. Um, now, the setting up the administration of the common chest, I also thought this was interesting. So the administration of the common chest shall be set up in the following manner. Annually, each year, on the Sunday following the octave of Epiphany, at about 11 o'clock, uh, they're very specific, a general assembly of the parish shall convene here in the town hall. There, by the grace of God, united in true Christian faith, they shall elect from the entire assembly ten trustees or directors for the common chest, who shall be without exception the best qualified individuals. Namely, two from the nobility, two from the incumbent city council, three from among the common citizens of the town, and three from the rural peasantry. The ten, thus duly elected, shall immediately assume the burden and responsibility of administering, uh, administration and trusteeship of the common chest. They shall do so voluntarily and with a good Christian conscience for the sake of God and the general welfare. They shall discharge their duties to the best of their ability without regard to favor, animosity, personal advantage, fear, or any unseemly consideration, and shall be pledged and bound faithfully and honestly to handle the administration, receipts, and disbursements according to the terms of our agreement herein described. I, what I, what I, I thought was fascinating with this is 
This is basically a, a, a collective church action. But the priest isn't even part of this group. They have uh, two from the nobility, two from the city council. So the, the leading class gets four votes, but the common people get six votes. That was another interesting thing. Three from the peasantry and three from those living in the city. So the, the common people outrule the ruling class, which is really a, a, a wise thing to do because you're distributing to the needs of the poor. You know, you don't want to put people who live in an ivory tower in charge of distributing to the poor because they don't know the needs of the poor. They're not living among them. So they pick people who are living among them, who know them by sight, who interact with them on a daily basis. They're the majority, uh, and they control the main vote. So the, it, there's a lot of wisdom wrapped up in this, and the fact that they spread the responsibility around so it's the entire community's responsibility, and not just a select few. Each, each group within the community bears part of this responsibility. And they set even the time of when they're supposed to meet and make sure this is all done in order. So now, just some parting questions with all this. So how are our circumstances different than in the 16th century? Um, if, for one thing, we, and it kind of this goes to the last question, are our homeless the same today as then? In our city, in our community here, there are some poorer people, but there are not the destitute that they had here to deal with. You know, we have poor, we have people who live on the extreme level of, of the, the poverty index, but we, we don't have people literally starving because they can't find food. Uh, our city does have a food pantry, Hubbard does, that's a positive thing. Um, their rules back then was each city was responsible to its own. So, uh, you know, if people from the poor in another city heard that that city had better stuff, they'd try and come and take it. Uh, this group prevented that from happening, or at least repeatedly. I'm sure they would help someone. So the, the, the nature of the poor, I think, are different in our culture. The fact that there are government programs to help the poor, and there's finances coming from uh, government agencies for the poor, at least in theory, is different in our culture than in theirs, because they had no government program, per se, for the poor. So that's, that's a different aspect, uh, which complicates our, our role as church, because the tendency is, well, if government's taking care of this and there's government programs for it all, why do we have to bother with it? Uh, this, is a, this is a Christian responsibility. This isn't the government responsibility. I mean, it is that, too, in a way, but it is, it is primarily a Christian responsibility. We should not neglect it simply because there are other options out there for people. So our circumstances are a little different. Uh, what else is different in our circumstances is um, the dependencies on drugs and alcohol and why people become poor now and destitute. Um, we don't want to feed that as a church. So a policy in place of absolutely never giving out cash to anyone is a good policy. If somebody has needs, buy the needs, but not give the cash. That's too easily used for the wrong things. And then the, the question which we did address a little bit last time, uh, what if beggars lie and take advantage of us? Well, they will, ultimately, sometimes. When you're charitable, people will take advantage of that. Um, I, a, a, we have to act within the best wisdom God has given us. And if it seems not right, then we need to be wise enough not just to feel we have to give something. I had a guy, I've, I, I know I've told you this too, so sorry for repeating. I had a guy when I was in Minnesota on Vicarage, an Indian, um, come in, and he was poor. He gave me this whole homeless, homeless spiel and needed help, but he wanted Lysol because he said he had a foot problem, and that didn't make any sense to me. 
So I refused him, I, I didn't give him the Lysol. Um, found out the next day he went next door to the, the church, uh, it was an ELCA church, went next door to them, they gave him the Lysol and he promptly drank it and wound up in the emergency room and was hospitalized for three days because he was a severe alcoholic. I don't know if a Lysol even has alcohol in it, but he drank it, and it just about killed him. So, you know, you, we've got to use common sense in, our, in the world today with distributing to the needs of the poor. It's not the wants of the poor, it's the needs of the poor. And if the wants don't sound right, you know, we've got to act upon proper wisdom. Um, but ultimately, if we are taken advantage of and we act in good faith, it's on, it's on them. It's not on us. We, for our part, have fulfilled our duties, and that's what's important, too. All right, any thoughts, any questions, any comments on <clears throat> the common chest, the ordinance of the common chest? It's just a reminder to us as a church that we, too, need to have an eye on the poor and need to be generous and diligent about this. This isn't, this isn't a haphazard thing. Uh, this is how people who don't know our teaching or God's word will see Christ in action. And, and that bears witness to them of the Savior we have. And it hopefully draws them to the church as well because they want to be part of that Savior that helped them when they needed it. So it's, a, it's, it's an important part of our witness of the gospel. All right. Thoughts? Nothing? Okay, next one. against the Sabbatarians. Um, the Sabbatarians were a group. Luther had lots of, lots of, um, anytime there was a conflict, uh, anytime there was something uh, theologically debatable, he wound up with it. Somebody would write him and say, hey, we want you to address this. Uh, this, is, this is one such thing. There was a small group, and they were small, uh, a group known as Sabbatarians. And Luther was asked to address their teaching. Uh, Sabbatarians were a group of Christians, most from among the Anabaptist rebaptizers, uh, who believed that the Old Testament Sabbath laws should be followed. Now, Anabaptists today, the descendants of the Anabaptists that we have among us would be like Mennonites. Um, uh, they, were, they were Anabaptists. But the theology of the rebaptizing thing, we see that prevalent among the evangelicals, especially the, the kind of non-denominational churches that don't believe in infant baptism. Uh, but nonetheless, um, among this rebaptizer group, there were these Sabbatarians. Two men who wrote pamphlets espousing these views were Anabaptist preachers, one named Oswald Glate, another Andreas Fisher. Um, so, the Sabbatarians believed the Old Testament Sabbath was to be followed. Uh, Oswald Galate, a little background on him, the leader among Anabaptist movement, he publicly promoted pacifism and rejection of military service. He advocated for the reinstitution of Saturday Sabbath, which he regarded, uh, which he argued had been the original practice of the Apostolic Church of the New Testament. He preached that Christ's second coming was to occur in the very new future. Glate was attached to the Hutterite movement of Moravia. He was arrested and imprisoned in Vienna, 1545, and taken out at night and drowned in the autumn of 1546. When Anabaptists got radical, drowning was the normal method of execution by the government because they were rebaptizers. So it's, you want to be rebaptized? Rebaptize this, and they drown them. Yeah, uh, so it was brutal, but that's how they operated. Uh, this business of the argument that worshiping on Saturday as the Sabbath is the original practice of the apostolic church is not completely wrong. Uh, from, from my understanding, the early Christians immediately after Christ for the first few decades, did worship in the, in the uh, synagogue and in the, uh, in the temple on the Sabbath with the Jews. But they would worship Christ. Uh, 
they still participated in the Jewish liturgy, but they, you know, had this messianic focus that the other Jews didn't. And eventually, about, uh, about 100 AD and a little, a little before, the Jews threw the Christians out. Uh, kicked them out of, the, out of the synagogues because they didn't want that influence in the synagogues anymore. And then more, even though the early Christians did start worshiping on Sunday to some degree, it was at that point what it really kind of took hold as the mark of Christianity that we worshiped on Sunday, not the Saturday Sabbath. But the early Christians did not worship on Saturday to fulfill Old Testament law, Sabbath law. They worshiped on Saturday simply because that's when everybody got together. That was their normal church day, so they continued it. So there's, he's right on the one hand that the very earliest church did worship on the Saturday, but he's wrong in that they did it out of the sense of having to fulfill Sabbath law. That was not why they did it. So next guy, Andreas Fischer, uh, was an Austrian Moravian Anabaptist associate of Oswald Glate. He defended not only adult baptism, but also following Glate, the reinstitution of Saturday Sabbath, keeping as a Christian practice. Eventually, he found an accepting audience for his ideas among a population of minors who were staging uh, strikes and revolts throughout that decade. Fisher was arrested and put to death in 1540. Uh, they, were, they were put to death not just because of their doctrine. They were put to death because of their, by, the, by the civil government because of their public agitation. They encouraged mobs. Uh, they encouraged civil unrest and, and, and disobedience to government. They were radicals. All right, first asterisk. Uh, for Luther, the heart of the issue was that this represented a rise of a form of legalism seen in rabbinical Judaism that supplanted the gospel. Luther seems to believe that the movement among these Anabaptists was directly influenced by certain Jewish teachers, though there doesn't seem to be any evidence of this. The majority of his letter is occupied with the general topic of the Jews' relationship to the law and their insistence on following the letter of Mosaic law as a path to eternal life. But from this larger discussion, he draws inferences applicable to the Sabbatarian issue. So the big picture issue is, why do you want to worship on the Sabbath? <clears throat> and the answer was, because the law says we should. <clears throat> and the law is the problem. Uh, because we are simply not bound to the law in the same way as the Jews were. We have the gospel. And the Jews misunderstood their law. They became bound to the law for law's sake instead of as a preparation of the gospel. Uh, we'll hash that out a little bit in the following. Uh, here, after discussing uh, how God converted heathen kings in the Old Testament and how after their conversion God did not bind them to his law, Luther concludes that binding people now to such laws is wrong. So <clears throat> he starts in the Old Testament with his argument. In the Old Testament, we have examples like Jonah going to Nineveh. Uh, Nineveh, which was an utterly godless culture, uh, practice some of the worst kinds of hedonism. Uh, Jonah didn't even want to go to Nineveh to proclaim the gospel, precisely because he knew the people would probably convert and be persuaded by his arguments, and he didn't want to see them saved. They were so corrupt. So he you know, jumps in a boat, goes in the opposite direction. God has to cause a storm, get him thrown over the board, getting eaten by a fish who swam to Nineveh and puked him up on the land, and then he goes and preaches. And sure enough, when they heard the gospel, they converted and repented of their sins. When that culture was converted, Jonah did not establish Jewish law for them. He didn't, he didn't insist they be circumcised. He didn't insist they follow Sabbath laws or purity laws. They simply repented of their sins, and he told them of forgiveness in God's grace. That was it. They were not subject to the Jewish laws, but they were saved. So if you can be saved without the law, why insist on the law, is Luther's argument. And that's not the only example. You know, we, we spent several months going through Old Testament books. Um, we heard about Nebuchadnezzar, perhaps the greatest king of all time in, uh, in ancient Babylon. 
Nebuchadnezzar ultimately converted to Christianity. Well, to, to, that wasn't Christianity at that point. Converted to the true faith, to the one true God. Believed in the one true God. He was not commanded to be circumcised. He didn't have to obey Sabbath laws or purity laws or any of the other Jewish laws. But his faith was real and saving. So if all of these people throughout Old Testament history could be saved apart from the law, why now insist that the law is necessary for salvation in this way? So this is going to be Luther's argument. So here's a paragraph from his writing. Uh, now, if it was not necessary to impose circumcision and the law of Moses upon the heathen kings in Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and upon many others who nevertheless believed in the God of Abraham and were saved, uncircumcised and without the law of Moses, at a time when Israel flourished most and when the people were set up in their government in Jerusalem and the Holy Land, why should we Gentiles now be obliged to observe their circumcision and law, which has fallen, fallen into disuse and which the Jews themselves cannot keep, because they have lost their country, city, government, and all the ordinances of Moses, and have no promise that they shall ever recover them? In conclusion, you should cite, is that, yeah, in conclusion, you should cite the passage of Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them. So God did promise in the Old Testament he would set up a new covenant, which is the gospel, a new, a new agreement for salvation, that it's all on Christ and his doing not on us and our doing. It's not the law, it's his gospel. So his point is that much of Jewish law was time-bound and culture-bound. Even in the day when Israel prospered and followed Mosaic law, God did not insist on others outside Israel having to follow it. All right. What's important to understand when it comes about the law and what is, what is easily attempted to be turned against us as conservative Christians is that there are three kinds of laws in Scripture. We are not bound to all three kinds of laws. So when I, when I uh, lectured at uh, Iowa State at eth in the ethics class and talked about same-sex marriage being contrary to God's moral law. And the kid in the back asked me if I ate shellfish. And I said, yes. Then he said, you are a hypocrite because the law says you shouldn't eat shellfish. So how come you follow some laws and not others? You're cherry picking. Well, he didn't understand there are different kinds of laws in Scripture. Uh, not all are bound uh, to us or we to them. So here are the three kinds of laws. Uh, Mosaic law was composed of three kinds. Ceremonial, to start with. Uh, laws dealing with the ceremonial worship life of Israel. It defined types of sacrifices, methods for offering them, dates and times for feasts and festivals, who was eligible for the priesthood, how priests were to dress, how worship space was to be made and maintained. Every aspect of Israel's worship was defined by ceremonial law. Such laws are often highly symbolic, pointing to God's salvation of humanity in Christ. You know, for example, purity laws, Passover laws, Sabbath laws. So just an example. Look up Exodus 12, 1 to 11. And here you have an example of Passover laws. These are ceremonial laws about the Jewish ceremony of Passover. You will see how highly symbolic they are and how Christological they are. They're pointing to Jesus. That was their point. Why they existed, to point to Jesus. So Exodus 12, 1 to 11. Now the Lord spake, spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. 
And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to their number of persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. <coughs> you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of their houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night roasted in fire with unleavened bread. With bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and entrails. Uh, you shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains until morning you shall burn with fire. Okay, so that, that is the original prescription for Passover that was to be followed ceremonially in every generation thereafter in Israel until Christ came. Because Christ was the point of this ceremony. You know, John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God is the Passover Lamb. It is the male of the first year, without spot or blemish. You know, that's Jesus, without spot or blemish. Uh, to be killed at twilight, Christ crucified about that time. The blood spread on the doors, the blood marking the people of God where the angel would pass over, just like Christ's blood marks us so that God's wrath passes over us. Everything points to Jesus in this. It's all Christological. So that's that ceremonial law. It's very symbolically charged, pointing to Jesus. Uh, once Jesus came, once Jesus fulfilled it, there's no point to it. Why keep practicing symbols when you have the real thing? So the church never did practice this ceremony. Purity laws, another one. Numbers 19, 1 through 13. Numbers 19, 1 to 13. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer without blemish, in which there is no defect and on which a yoke has never come. You shall give it to Eliezer the priest, that he may take it outside the camp and shall be slaughtered before him. And Eliezer the priest shall take some of the blood with his finger and sprinkle some of the blood seven times directly in front of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the heifer shall be burned in the sight in his sight, its hide flesh, its blood, its offal shall be burned, and the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast them into the midst of the fire, burning the heifer. Then the priest shall wash his clothes, he shall bathe in water, and afterwards he shall come into the camp. The priest shall be unclean until evening. And the one who burns it shall wash his clothes in water, bathe in water, and shall be unclean until evening. Then the man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and store them outside the camp in a clean place, and they shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for the water of purification. It is for purifying from sin. And the one who gathers the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until that evening. It shall be a statute forever to the children of Israel and to the stranger who sojourns among them. He who touches the dead body of anyone shall be unclean seven days. He shall purify himself with the water on the third day and on the seventh day, and then he will be clean. But if he does not purify himself on the third day and on the seventh day, he will not be clean. Whoever touches the body of anyone who has died and does not purify himself defiles the tabernacle of the Lord. That person shall be cut off from Israel. He shall be unclean because the water of purification was not sprinkled on him. His uncleanness is still on him. I mean, it's, there's, there's, and it goes on. More cleanness and uncleanness after that. So, uncleanness was fixed or purified through water, which had been mixed with the ashes of a heifer. Now, where's the symbolism there? Water mixed with, a, with death, essentially. A water born from death. It's, it's actually a baptismal symbol. Why does God have us wash in water and have his name spoken over us? 
It's, he purifies us by joining himself to us, by putting his name in us through the water. You know, baptism is a marvelous extension of this. Um, and, and it is a mark of being washed and cleaned by our triune God. Jesus, by the way, uh, and, and, and Sabbath laws too, the next one, Jesus, by the way, went out of his way to offend the rabbis with these ceremonial laws. He broke them right in front of their noses, purposely to goad them. Because what, what happened with the Jews and their ceremonial laws, good grief, it's already, already late. What happened with the Jews and their ceremonial laws is the law became the thing unto itself for them. And they lost sight of all of the Christological focus wrapped up in these ceremonial laws. They didn't look at these things in messianic terms anymore. They were just rules that if they kept, God was going to be happy with them. And so the more they kept, the more happy God would be with them. So law became the focus of the rabbis. Uh, to the point where you get you know, things like the Talmud, which is a collection of the sayings of the rabbis, which is just volumes of their musings over the laws and trying to apply the law to every bizarre situation they can think of. Um, the law was all-consuming. It was everything. That was their path to heaven. And they lost Christ because of it. They couldn't see him anymore because the law was their focus to heaven. Last point, Sabbath laws, and this is the one that's directly applicable to the Sabbatarians. So Exodus 13, 1 to 23. Uh, yeah, actually, skip that because it's longer and we're running out of time. Go to the Leviticus one because it's virtually the same thing, just a little shorter. Leviticus 25, 1 to 7. Both of them talk... Part of Sabbath laws wasn't just Sabbath days. It was also Sabbath years. So if you're going to keep Sabbath law, and you're going to say the Old Testament Sabbath is necessary for salvation, that's all of the Sabbath. That's not just you got to worship on Saturday. That means you got to also have Sabbath years, every seventh year. So what happens on Sabbath years? Leviticus 25, 1 to 7. Uh, and the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, and the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord, six years you shall sow your fields, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its fruits. But the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. What grows of its own accord in your harvest you shall reap, you shall not reap nor gather the grapes of your un untended vine, for it's a year of rest for the land. And the Sabbath produce of the land shall be food for you, for you and your servant, for your maidservant and your hired servant, for the stranger who sojourns with you, for your livestock and the animals that are in your land, all its produce shall be for food. It'd be rough being a farmer as an ancient Jew. Because every seventh year you can't farm. You gotta leave your land rest. It'd be hard just living. I mean, imagine having to plan for that. Constantly storing up stuff so you can go a whole year without without work, without without farming, without harvest. That'd be rough. But that is part of Sabbath law. Exodus. 31, if you broke Sabbath law, the consequences were severe. Exodus 31, 12 to 17. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. By the way, the word sign means symbol. And you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall utterly be put to death. 
For whoever does not, for whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. So you profane the Sabbath day, it's a death sentence. Uh, Sabbath, stay in Exodus 35, 1 to 3, other things the Sabbath included. Uh, the, the, Exodus 35, 1 to 3, Then Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said to them, These are the words that the Lord has commanded you to do. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day shall be a holy day to you, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your habitation on the Sabbath day. You couldn't even start a fire. Which makes Sabbath kind of chilly on, in winter, you know? So even that was considered work that you shouldn't do. Uh, the next citation from Numbers is an example of a man they caught gathering sticks on the Sabbath. And they dragged him, dragged him before Moses and said, what should we do with this guy? And Moses said, put him to death. Just, just picking up sticks in his yard is punishable by death. Uh, the Deuteronomy citation will say that the animals couldn't work on the Sabbath. Your servants couldn't work on the Sabbath. Guests in your house couldn't do any work on the Sabbath. Nobody could do anything on the Sabbath. Not even little work. Now the rabbis picked that up and ran with it, and they started putting numbers on it. What does it mean not to do any work? Uh, it means you can't even uh, lift a burden more than 10 pounds and carry it. You know, rabbinical law. So, absolutely no work of any kind. If you're going to keep Sabbath law, and you're going to say that's necessary for salvation, it's a whole lot bigger than just not worshiping on Saturday. Um, the modern day equivalent we have of Sabbatarians would be Seventh-day Adventists. And there are a lot of them. Uh, there aren't around here, but there are nationwide. Um, my my, my daughter-in-law, Zach's wife, was a Seventh-day Adventist and raised Seventh-day Adventist. Um, and the laws that they followed, it, it's curious. It's curious the way they, they functioned. Um, certain laws like eating meats... They wouldn't eat meat as a religious devotional thing. So she grew up vegetarian. But um, when it comes to Sabbath laws, they insisted on Saturday worship. And they, they go as far in their writings, if you read Seventh-day Adventist stuff, where they actually say anybody who worships on Sunday, this is the mark of the Antichrist. And the only day you can worship is on the Saturday Sabbath. That's it. And, of course, proudly boasting, they keep the ancient Saturday Sabbath. No, they don't. They might worship on Saturday, but that is the only aspect of the Saturday Sabbath they keep. They're not doing Sabbath years, which was just as much of a command as Sabbath days. They're not enforcing the strict no work of any kind where you can't even start a fire, where your servants can't work, where you can't do anything. They, don't, they ignore all of that. So the only thing they do is they don't worship on Sunday. They worship on Saturday and then claim they're following Sabbath law. You know, this, this is the catch when you, when you start insisting on the laws necessary for salvation, you either get yourself so tied up in laws that you drive yourself to despair because you realize you can't keep them, or you, you cherry pick. You say, yeah, these laws I got to keep, but those don't really matter. You know, I don't have to keep those. Um, and that's what Seventh-day Adventists do. That's their tact. They just cherry pick the ones they want to keep and make all these wonderful excuses why the other ones don't seem to apply anymore. All right, so that's, that's Sabbath laws. And this is, again, part of the argument here, why not Sabbatarians? Because they're cherry-picking the law, and they're making the law a path to eternal life, and they're binding themselves to law that we are free not to follow anymore. Um, Two verses which we need to address yet before we leave that section. Colossians 2, 16 to 17, and Matthew 12. Now, we said, start with Colossians, we said that these ceremonial laws and Sabbath laws do fall under the category of ceremonial laws. 
that the ceremonial laws were highly symbolic uh, and Christological in nature. So how in the world is not doing any work of any kind, not even picking up sticks in your yard, how is that symbolic of Christ? It actually is. So Colossians. Timothy, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Where is it? Philippians, there we are. Colossians 2, 16 to 17. Uh, 16, there we are, finally. Uh, Therefore, let no one judge you in food or in drink regarding a festival, a new moon, or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So Sabbaths are a shadow of things to come. They are symbolic. The substance is Christ. Now Matthew 12, 1 to 14. Matthew 12, 1 to 14. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. Then his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what's not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Then he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him. How he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat nor for those who were there with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? In in other words, the priests are doing work on the Saturday. You know? Uh, Six, but I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I had desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And then the next bit. Now, when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might accuse him? Then he said to them, What is... Uh, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and and lift it out? Of how much more value, then, is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. All right, so Christ is Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is pointing to Jesus. How? How do you think? How is the Sabbath pointing to Christ? Nobody wants to stick their neck out. There you go. He is the ultimate rest. In a, in a, in a scheme of working your way to heaven, Jesus comes along and says, your work, just take a break, Your work isn't going to get you to heaven. My work will. I'll do this for you. And then he proceeds to offer the Father the work necessary for our eternal life. So he does it to perfection. We're saved by his work. So we can rest from this burden of thinking we have to work to earn God's love. It is not our obedience to the law that makes God love us. It was Christ's obedience and Christ's sacrifice for us that made God love us. So it's all on him to, be, to do the work needed for our eternal rest with God. That's how the Sabbath was supposed to be pointed to Christ. Every time the Jews sat around and did no work, they were supposed to be thinking of God is going to send me a Messiah who will do all the work needed so that my soul can rest. You know, this, this is, was to be their focus, but it wasn't. The law became a thing unto itself to where they lost sight of Christ and it was all about their obedience. Uh, so, why don't we need to do this, the, the ancient Saturday Sabbath? Because Christ came. He did the work. We truly have a rest in him. Um, our work will not earn us a minute in heaven. His work did. So it's all about him. The ancient Christians chose Sunday when they got booted out of, the, out of the synagogues. They chose Sunday as their worship day instead of Saturday 
Why? And this is while, this is while the apostles, St. John especially, was still alive. So this wasn't without apostolic directive. Some of the apostles were still living. Why choose Sunday instead of the ancient Saturday Sabbath? Sun Sunday is the day Christ rose from the dead. So every Sunday for us is a reminder of the resurrection. That's why they chose Sunday. Uh, to us, Sunday is the seventh day. To, the, to them, the Sunday was, Sunday was the eighth day. It was from their week Sunday to Sunday, they counted each day unto itself. So when he got to the next Sunday, in their, in their way of counting, it was eight. Eight is the day of the new creation. Uh, eight is the ending of the old seven-day creation and the beginning of something new. There were these marvelous symbols tied up to why they picked Sunday. Why was this a new creation? Because Christ rose from the dead and we have a new creation in him. We are part of that new creation of his resurrection. So Sunday becomes the day to remember the resurrection. Um, Luther will go on basically to say, um, it doesn't matter what day we pick anymore because the ancient Saturday day was ceremonial law doesn't apply to us. As long as we are gathering and receiving God's word and hearing it, and, and, and receiving Christ's grace and forgiveness, we are keeping the Sabbath day. All right, I want to, what do we got here? Six minutes. I want to go two more minutes and just finish this section on, on the different kinds of law. So that, that whole spiel was ceremonial law, now civil law. Civil laws were dealing with Jewish society in order, giving prescriptions for punishments of criminal behavior. Uh, civil law does sometimes intersect with moral and ceremonial law, so there were, there were various laws that the Jews had that applied to them, various penalties prescribed by God for breaking certain laws that kept Jewish society in order. We're also not bound by them. Uh, laws of redemption are an example. If you sold a piece of property, every seven years, the person who sold it to you had the option of buying it back. They could redeem it from you. Um, we consider private property our own, and we get to do with it what we want, and once we own it, we own it for life until we decide to sell it. It's not the way they worked. We're not, out, we're not subject to those old laws about property anymore. We can do what we want. Moral law, the last law, laws applicable to all people, not just the Jews. They re are repeated in both testaments to show applicability in all times. So the only form of law still applicable to us today is moral law. And we know a law is a moral law if it's repeated in the Old Testament and the New, showing it's applicable to God's people throughout time. We know it's moral law if it's applied to all people everywhere, not just the Jews. So, thou shalt not kill. It's a universal moral law applicable to all people at all times. Not commit adultery, another one. Not stealing. Those are moral laws applicable to all people of all times. So back in my lecture at Iowa State when I was telling people that homosexuality was contrary to God's law and it was sinful, that's moral law applicable to all people in all times. Repeated in both testaments. Um, applied beyond the Jewish borders. Uh, shellfish and not eating shellfish was a Jewish ceremonial law not applicable beyond the Jewish culture of the Old Testament. All right, that's where we got to quit. Any comments, thoughts, or anything just on that bit there? We'll finish this discussion then when I'm back. Next week I'm not here. Um, uh, Fort Wayne is electing a new president at the seminary. I'm on the border region, so I have to be there for that next weekend. Uh, Pastor Lovrens will be here. He'll have something, I don't know what, uh, but we'll pick up our discussion of this sort of thing again in two weeks. So let's close with prayer. Uh, merciful Lord, we pray your blessings that you might help us understand your word and apply it rightly to ourselves. Strengthen us in right faith. Point us to our Savior and secure us in the grace and the eternal life which he has won for us through his work. In Jesus' name, amen.